This episode is brought to you by HP+. In a world full of smart devices, isn't it about time your printer got smart too? Now printing is smart with HP+. And the HP Smart app is how it all happens. You can print from your phone with just a tap, no matter where you are. Even from your garage slash home office slash yoga studio. Huh, that is smart. HP+. Learn more about smart printing at hp.com slash smart. Hey, everybody, it's Mark Pattison. I'm back once again for another phenomenal podcast on the network here. This week, I've got another amazing uh, guest doing incredible things. But before we get to that, I want you and remind you to go to my website, www.markpattisonnfl.com. And of course, you can see all these other really incredible podcasts of you know, people overcoming adversity and finding their way. And as always, I encourage you to go to iTunes and give a ratings and review. Uh, it helps with the popularity of the show, which just gives us more exposure to these amazing stories that are out there. Number two, we have the film, the NFL film on Everest that's coming out in September. I will keep you posted on that. We are having a big program here in, in Sun Valley, Idaho uh, on the 23rd. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be amazing. And uh, all to go to higher ground, which leads me to my third point, the philanthropy tab. Um, everything I do uh, in terms of, of uh, philanthropy, fundraising, goes to my campaign within higher ground called Amelia's Everest. My daughter has epilepsy. She's fighting her way through that. And, and Higher Ground is just an amazing organization helping, in a lot of cases, military people coming back that are wounded, that are banged up, that have cognitive issues. And uh, Higher Ground is there to help serve those people in so many ways. Okay, let's get into today's podcast. I've got an incredible guy I actually met through Higher Ground named David Vorbora. David, how are you doing? Hey, Mark. I'm excited for this combo, buddy. Yeah, you know, actually, I was going to start off with uh, something you've heard in the past, but I was going re- to, I, I gave you due respect and, and called you by your first name. There's another <laughs> name that you're associated with called Mr. Irrelevant. Yeah, buddy, the infamous title. Yeah, so let me just set this up and I'll let you take it off uh, from there. So one of the common bonds that you and I have, and we have a lot of them, as it all turns out, is that you were an NFL football player. You look like one, you have the heart of one, and, and certainly you had your day in the sun. But, you know, by the time in, 19, in 2008, I was drafted in, in uh, 1985 by the Raiders. By the time that you got drafted in 2008, obviously I'm older than you are, they broke it down from 12 rounds down to seven rounds. So explain exactly what this term means, Mr. Relevant, yeah. and what that meant on that particular day for you. Yeah, so it's funny to set the stage here. I was slated as a mid to late round pick, right, for whatever that is in the imperfect science that is the NFL draft. And the draft rolled on and on. I think most of my friends were probably drunk and passed out by the time that my name got called. I just so happened to be the 252nd pick in the 2008 draft, crowning me Mr. Irrelevant. Now, I had no idea this even existed. It's like five picks to the end, and somebody in the room says, hey, I heard that the last pick like gets a car or something. And at the time, I'm driving a moped at the University of Idaho. So I'm like, dude, anything's an upgrade for me. I'll take a car, even if it's a hand-me-down. So we Google it, and then there's like this whole week out in Orange County, and they celebrate the first or the last is the first. And there's all this. And I'm like, well, that'd be kind of fun. And then sure enough, right, Scott Linehan is the head coach of the Rams. He calls me. I end up, you know, and he says, listen, don't worry about this title. We're drafting you to play, man. Come ready to go. And that's all I needed to hear, right? Call me Mr. Anything You Want. I got drafted in the NFL. And, you know, the, the travesty is actually the second to last pick because he doesn't get all the hoopla, the media platform. You know, I got flown to Orange County, drove a Lamborghini for the week, Disneyland, the Playboy Mansion, Tonight Show, all that stuff, which is all fine. Um, it's a little tongue in cheek. But like I said, like I was going to use this foot in the door. Guys like you and me, Mark, like we're going to blast it wide open and create an opportunity. Yeah, that's great. That's great. You know, as you were talking about, I am from the Pacific Northwest. So are you. You grew up in Eugene, Oregon, and all of a sudden yeah. you find a a home at the University of Idaho. And I've been there in Moscow, Idaho. Yeah. Actually, we used to stay there for the Huskies when we play Washington State Pullman, which is only about eight miles away. Yep. And, you know, when you came and we were first introduced to each other a month ago, we are recording now on July 27th. This show will come out probably in a month or so. But yeah. when we talked a month ago or so, you know, I was I was really 
impressed with your size, which isn't abnormal for a linebacker in the NFL. You look like you fit that role perfectly. But I'm always surprised at how, you know, typically a guy, especially who makes it all the way up in, in, into the NFL, regardless, because when I was a seventh round pick, I wasn't Mr. Irrelevant because we had 12 picks, right? Yeah. So, yeah. you know, but at the end of the day, you and I got drafted around the same. You're seventh round, I'm a seventh round. Um, I looked the part for Washington at the time. You looked the part like you could have played for Washington or USC or any other mm-hmm. school at the time. But how does a guy go from Eugene, Oregon, the backyard? You've yeah. got University of Oregon that is cranking in football that they yeah. somehow or another slip through the cracks and you end up at a smaller school. Yeah, you know, my pops was a duck he actually played against you he was a linebacker from uh, 78 to 81 uh, for the ducks and so you know for me i was always a skinny pencil neck quarterback i actually didn't convert to a linebacker until i got to college so i was an athlete right that sort of title which should be a compliment but at the same time it kind of says like hey he's athletic enough to play multiple spots but we don't know if he's excellent at any of them so there's a lot of development that needed to be made and again, I would add one D1 offer, right? Oregon, Oregon State, all those people pulled out and said, we, you'd be a preferred walk-off. And I mm-hmm. said, sorry, I need to get free school. Plus, I wanted to play D1 at a level where I had the opportunity early. So, you know, 190 pounds soaking wet playing linebacker, getting my ass handed to me uh, as a true freshman. But it was an opportunity, you know, we weren't real good, you know, during those years. Actually, we were terrible. I shouldn't even say real good. We were in the basement of the NCAA but it was an opportunity for me to fly all over the field, make a lot of tackles. And it ultimately led to moving up to the next level and, and, you know, being able to embrace this underdog role. I was going to exceed expectations through hard work. So this is for the audience right now. Um, so anybody that's listening to this pod, this, this first part of the pod is all about me. Cause I want to hear about your football stuff. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, what we are going to dig into is this, this, this incredible work that you're doing, the impact that you're having. Mm-hmm. And I saw it firsthand and I was blown away. It literally brought me to tears and mm-hmm. we're going to get into that in just a minute, but uh, a couple more things, because I, I think this was really interesting. It was just kind of a factoid um, on, on you which is that, you know, you're playing in the NFL like I was and, and as athletes, and we're seeing this right now because Olympics are going on is that all the athletes are out there trying to get the edge, you know, food, diet, you know, all the nutrition, new ways to, to exercise, to refine your body, you Mm -hmm. know, hand eye, you know, whatever it takes, like you're always looking for what's the next thing, how can I get you better and how can you get the edge on somebody else? And one of those things that you did was you were taking various supplements. Like I take protein powder today. Yep. It's a natural food-based or plant-based uh, protein. And that's why I take two scoops and I put it into my seven summit smoothie. You'll like that, yep. right? Love and, it. And yeah, so so back in the day, um, I want you to explain what happened because, yep. you know, it's just a huge lesson for manufacturers and people out there in the supplement business about yep. what they put into their their various ingredients of the products that they're yeah building. yeah the the proprietary blend right they, they yeah. there's certain things that they can or that they have to report and certain things that they don't and within that proprietary blend is where you get into trouble it's the wild west now i did things by the book which i was always a by the book guy believe me had i been on steroids my my physique would have looked drastically different i i would say with how much i was working out and, and again mm-hmm. i think that edge a lots of times it comes in that bucket of recovery if you can recover faster right you can then go further go harder go faster so you know, for me, it was like, I called the hotline for this product. They said, Hey, there's nothing that you're reporting that is on the label. Um, this is not a product that we're largely familiar with, but you know, we would counsel you that you're taking this at your own discretion. I did that twice with two different people, decided to take the supplement, knew some other people taking the supplement long and short ended up popping for performance enhancing drugs, knew that I did nothing wrong, put everything in my locker. I swear I used every penny I had in my rookie bank account shipped it to this very, very, very valid, very expertise lab. And they did a bunch of, you know, breakdowns and components. They found that it was tainted. But again, at first you're trying to go and, and, and contend or appeal this suspension, this four game suspension. And it's all internal. Nobody in the outside world knows. Eventually when we realize that the NFL doesn't care, I don't care if it was a broccoli supplement, right? And only broccoli was in there. They still are going to stand by, Hey, what's in your body is your responsibility. And that's how I would counsel anybody you know, that, that is looking for an edge, I would say err on the side of, of being prudent, not taking it um, and figuring out other ways than, to, than taking it and risking it. But ended up having to take the suspension. 
And that sucked, man. Like those that loved me and knew me knew the truth, but I got hate mail. I'd have fans like my son's tearing up your card. You're a cheat. You're a fraud. And it makes you like, again, like I'd never, I was never the first round draft pick. So I didn't have a ton of scrutiny on the outside world, but suddenly it was there. And so I had to, my world got really small. I anchored myself in the things that I could control and then had to work through two years in court to eventually get exonerated and and still won the largest supplement case uh, to date of all time against a pro sports athlete. So yeah, to be exonerated is fine, but that gets printed in page 37, right? Compared to the front page one that was initially. So took a huge financial hit, took a huge reputation hit, but those that know me, those that have seen me and continue to see my life since then see that, listen, this guy's character is, is of high value. Yeah, and for those that don't know, typically the way the NFL pays out, if you're, you know, that you 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 establish your salary, and if you're playing 16 games, then every week you're getting one sixteenth of that salary. So if you're talking a four game suspension, that means yeah. you're getting four paychecks that aren't coming your way, right? Yeah, so, and that was big for Mister Irrelevant because he was not on the multi million dollar contract. No, I, sure. listen, I appreciate that. It was also back in 1985, so I get that. Okay, so it. now we get let's let's transition out of the NFL. So, like a lot of people, I was one of them, and 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 I credit the NFL today because there was so much more educational and there's so much more caretaking in terms of life after football and what to yeah. do in educational programs. So. So that's the good news. But at the end of the day, it's still a void. You know, you and I and other guys like that have driven this fast car for a long time. And it's the only car that you know, and it's the greatest thing of all time. There's nothing better. And then you go off this cliff and now you're asking the question, now what? And so I want to transition that in for you to, to you in terms of where you got inspired to yeah. start what we're going to talk about, ATF, Adaptive Training Foundation. So go ahead. Yeah. So, you know, again, I, my NFL career was respectable, did more than some, but less than most is how I say it. And, and again, I actually got hurt playing in Seattle for the Seahawks last play I played in the league. I, I had a catastrophic shoulder injury. Now that was what others saw. What was going on inside was an identity crisis and you nailed it, right? You reach this pinnacle. You're so hyper-focused and laser focused on being successful on the field that, you know, you, you start to identify overly with what you do as who you are. And so I face this identity, identity crisis, not dissimilar to our veterans, right? Our, our military service members who go out, they're achieving at the highest level, giving orders, taking orders. By the way, that's the real battlefield. And they're the ones that suddenly get ripped from that. They come home and they're like, well, what next, right? They don't, they don't necessarily have a roadmap for transitioning well to see that their gifts that made them great in service or on the football field apply to the next phases of their life. And so the, the, the frank truth is, is I coped using pain pills, drugs, anything I can get my hands on anything to numb myself. And, and now after a decade uh, post football and being able to see some of the things in my early childhood and some other developmental stuff, there was a lot of writing on the wall where I used football to achieve. So people would applaud. So they wouldn't ask me what the hell was really going on inside. Mm -hmm. Starting to address the reason behind the reason for some of this need to cope, right? That was where the real healing happened, but football and the opportunity to be in the NFL uh, was a platform for me to do the most significant work of my life, which is what I'm doing through this foundation. You know, the gym is a sanctuary in my eyes. It's one that the iron doesn't care what color, what sexual preference, what race, what gender, any of that. Right. And so I use the, the weight room as a way to see, wait a second, I love this. How can I help other athletes? But then I met a guy that got blown up, lost all four limbs, staff Sergeant Travis Mills, quadruple amputee, I was at a surprise birthday party for a friend. He walked in. I'm sure I was rude to whoever I was talking to because I beelined it for Trav. Mm -hmm. And I said, yo, dude, when was the last time you worked out? And he made a joke. You know, what are you, an asshole? I don't have arms and legs. I said, hey, I, I may be an asshole, but that's not why I said it. I think that there's something you have to tap into your phys physical identity or identification. How do you re-identify with, with the way that your body looks today? You know, and, and with that conversation, he took a chance on me. Pretty soon, everyone in the gym, right, their excuses disappeared. All my guys in the league, all my guys training from college to get ready for the league. It was like everyone had to elevate because there was this guy who seemingly had every reason to say no, but decided to say yes instead. And that was where I realized, man, there's this void post-rehab for people with disabilities. Plus, 
the gym that should be very inclusive is actually rather exclusive. And if people can't access it, how do you get this shift in perspective for all of us? Right, Mark? Like we shouldn't have to lose a limb to make a lifestyle or behavioral change that is, is an optimization for us. And it is for the one life that we get to live. So all of that to say, pretty soon I had 30 or 40 adaptive athletes, most of which were military and first responder, amputees, spinal cord injuries, neurological diseases like Parkinson's or MS. And we were creating a way to assess and train them, but I wasn't charging them because I was watching them find a life that they had marginalized or they'd kind of been on the sideline. Now I saw them engaging in the game. So I started the Adaptive Training Foundation, which is a 501c3 not-for-profit uh, we provide cost-free training for people with disabilities. We run a nine-week program. And then after training them for nine weeks, we take them on a week redeployment. And that's, Mark, where we just saw, uh, got to sync up in Sun Valley. Um, because now it's like you train for nine weeks. How do you apply yourself bombing it down a mountain, mountain biking, or climbing a rock face, or whitewater rafting like we did? Being able to adventure and experiencing things as, as, as an athlete. You know, a lot of these people, like Bill Bowerman said that if you have a human body, you're an athlete, whether you compete at sport or not that was really become an ethos for us because these people, they don't see themselves as, or didn't see themselves as athletes after they got hurt. Now we can redefine that and they can start to have opportunities to not just, you know, be a consumer, but then come back and train others like them as a contributor. Then it becomes full circle and you watch people, you know, take on their whole potential. Well, let's talk about that. By the way, Travis Mills was on the podcast. So if anybody wants yeah. to hear that, go back. Travis and- is his comedian. That's what he is. He is a legit stand-up comedian. He's hilarious. Yeah. And by the way, I believe your gym is in Dallas, uh, Texas, correct? Correct. Yes. Yeah. So l- let me give you this. This this is you came up with this, I, mean, I believe. But I think this says it all. To empower. This is what ATF is all about. Okay. To empower the human athlete. Restore hope through movement and redefine the limits of individuals with disabilities. That's it. I love it. Yeah. I love it. And, and I want to tell you quickly about my experience. So, so let, let's go back. So you're, you're in this new nine week program, right? And just like me, you know, I had a big flipping goal out there and the goal was Mount Everest and the goal was the seven summits. And I've had other goals as well. The NFL at one point college football, but, but most recently it was Mount Everest. And so I trained like a mother, you know, for, you know, throughout the last, actually the last couple of years, you know, hardcore two days, every single day, you know, for you, when I was talking to some of these, these different athletes that ended up on this, on this float trip, they would come in, I think work out at least, you know, two times a day. So they were on that same path. And then you're talking about um, after like post-graduation, they were awarded an opportunity to go do something spectacular. So they're training for this moment to go do something. So that the gal that you put me in the boat with, I, I literally, as she was telling me her story, I said, tell me your story. And, and I, I mean, I, 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 I could, I, like if I had five bottles of wine or took mushrooms, <laughs> you know, whatever analogy you want to make, I could never come up with this type of thing. And in her case, yeah. You know, she was somebody who probably made some bad choices in the people that she married, but the first guy was not a good guy, and, and he ended up shooting her. Yeah, tried to kill her. Yeah, tried to kill her, and she ended up paralyzed, from the, essentially from the waist down. Mm-hmm. And then uh, she divorces him and then ends up with another guy and on her wedding night, of all things, your wedding night, maybe she had a little bit too much to drink. She ends up on the floor of, of you know, on the bed. She had gone to the bathroom, couldn't get back in. And the Rottweiler that she owned came and shoot her leg off. So I'm sitting there talking to her. You know, she's paralyzed from the waist down with one of the, 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 the legs was from the, from the knee down off. And, yeah. and so I'm listening. It just like I couldn't even come with the, the amount of compassion and humility I had for like, like, you know, yeah, I just did Mount Everest. And that was really cool. And that was, you know, huge. But compared to what she was going through and her pain and her struggle, again, you know, the, the name of this podcast is called finding your summit about people overcoming adversity and finding their way. And, and for me to even compare my, my, my accomplishment compared to what she's going through. I mean, it, to me, it didn't even compare She was like miles in front of me. Yeah. Well, we all have our Everest and that's the beauty of this podcast. You know, I think the mountain humbles all people at some point. So it's about allies and alliances. It's about doing life with people that allow you to get out what you don't know how to say. Sometimes it takes, uh, that movie 180 degrees south is one of my favorites right is they're trying to um 
kind of uh, a pilgrimage to remap the way that Yvonne Chouinard and, and, and oh man, the, the other founder, not North Face or Patagonia, not the North Face founder. Anyway, they end up in Chile. It ends up being this, this moment where turning around is the hardest, right? The idea that like we have to look at the risk and evaluate the fact that we need, we need to turn, turn around 200 meters from the top, right? And that's the hardest decision to make. But the, it's not necessarily turning around if you're taking a step in the correct direction. But that's not for all people, right? How, how do you have people around you that aren't trying to keep you safe, right? Like my wife says all the time, she knows who she married, right? I can try to be smart. I can evaluate the risk and, and take different data points and then make a decision. But ultimately, I can't be safe, you know? And that's what we teach these athletes and enlist them because the athlete you were talking about in her story is as grandiose and ridiculous and unfathomable, unfathomable as it is. It's like, we, we all can find a little bit of ourselves in some of those stories. And so it's not that yours is bigger or smaller. It's just that like life doesn't discriminate, you know, a drunk driver, a tree falling, a gunshot, randomness, seemingly randomness can actually orchestrate the biggest, you know, intersection of meaning and purpose in our lives. Now, it doesn't have to take trauma, no, but it's certainly a motivating factor when your life's turned upside down and you're forced to surrender to the identity or identification with who you were. I say this all the time. I'm, I, my why, Dave Vibora's why, is helping people close the gap between who they think they are and who they're called to be. That's, that's, a, that's a powerful thing, right? Not become, right? I can't tell you what you're supposed to become because that's up to you to decide. But your choice to decide whether you're tapping into who you're called to be, that's a, that's a really wow thing. So you're shifting from extrinsic worth, value, and motivation to intrinsic. That type of person is unstoppable, right? I, I don't care who you are. You can transcend just about any type of pain and suffering when you have intrinsic value and worth. You know, Mark, I think, you know, you and I talked in just your own personal development that had allowed you to both have blinders on, but also be alert and aware of all the factors that you were making a choice, right? You're making a choice when you're going to do something like Everest, you're evaluating the risk and you're making the choice of the other trade-offs that you're not going to be able to, you know, point bandwidth and energy toward. And then you have to be okay when you hit the pillow at night as to why, but nobody else can tell you that nobody else can say that for you. You know, mm -hmm. every, lots of people watch a movie under a warm blanket about Everest and say, I'm going to do that one day. A little bit different when you're out of O2, you're, you're, uh, you know, you're up there by yourself and wondering, you're snow blind and wondering like, mm -hmm. holy crap, what now? You know, and I think that we are just giving them growth producing fear encounters. Not everybody has to be on Everest, but ways to look at their story so that they can supersede or transcend it. Yeah. So a lot to unpack there. The, the, the one thing as you're talking, you know, the thing that just kept hitting me, it was just mindset, mindset, mindset. Right. Nope. Because and I've said this plenty of times before to other people, like I can, I can give you the path and I can give you the magic formula, but it has to come within. And, and, and so you encounter so many people like, you know, so let's just go back to Everest for a minute. Okay. And of the 21 people, only 10 summited. Right. So that's more than 50% did not. And, and there was a chunk of people in there that came that were those people had read the book, seen the movie mm -hmm. and they were trying to be that, but they didn't have the true mindset of a warrior to take on what it was going to take to make that kind of effort of two yep. months of suffering of going up and down, have avalanches come at you and cold and all the other stuff that I encountered. Right. And so it was easy for them just to unplug and said, you know what, I'm just not going to make him a bad person. Sure. But they just didn't have the mindset of the champion to do that particular thing. Right. And so now I'm, I'm tapping into you and all the people on this trip. So I just gave one example of one person. Another gal had been become paralyzed or something, water skiing, and that was the first time she was going to be in the water. So you're constantly having all these types of athletes come at you. And unlike, you know, maybe if, if people were to come and everybody's healthy and walking in and, and, and now there's a slight mind shift, I mean, how do you get those guys – that have so many obstacles against them. How do you get them to take that kind of massive leap to get to where they want to go? Like you said, become the best version of themselves. Yeah. It's sweat psychology. Cause when your heart rate goes up, 
you start to learn about that monkey mind, right? What does your mind tell you? And can you acknowledge it, right? But then realize that it's not paying rent up there, right? Because there's something in here that, that scans every four seconds or even more often, depending on your sympathetic, parasympathetic, you know, uh, harmony. But it looks for safety and survival, right? It, it, it wants to evaluate danger where your why as to why you're putting yourself into inherent danger or exposure has to, has to be big enough and more significant enough to outweigh whatever this is telling you, right? There has to be a way for you to tap in to go beyond, right? Like Viktor Frankl did it in concentration camps, right? People do it in extreme sport. Stephen Koster's The Rise of Superman is a profound book talking about people tapping into that routinely so that they don't die on that 50 foot wave or in this, you know, extreme sport. So for me, it's, it's really Hansel and Gretel. It's like, Hmm, I'm going to sit back, pretend we, me and this person I'm training, this athlete I'm working with don't speak the same language. I speak English. They speak Japanese. So I have to put experiential learning opportunities because think about this through the business lens. If you're managing people, you're saying, Hey, we need this behavior to have this result. You got to do that over and over and over and over and over. If you create, now hear me, this is leadership. You create an experience that changes a belief, that shapes a behavior, that then changes a result. So you have to be able to go to the experience level. Sometimes I'm using weights and conditioning to reach them. Other times I'm using breath work and mindfulness, meditation. Sometimes I'm using situations like a root meeting. Twice during our nine-week program, we lock in all the athletes at a different time of the day, usually the evening. And our staff, and we talk about the reason behind the reason, right? You could go home every night reaching for a bottle of bourbon. The bourbon's a problem, but the reason's two or three back from that, yeah. right? And so I lead. Hey, look, here's my mess. Boo, right? Put it out there. Then suddenly I'm no longer on a pedestal and all these people, you give them permission, right? Because courage is action in the face of fear. And I believe vulnerability is the most powerful way to exhibit true courage, and so if you get people around people like that, especially alphas like you and myself that have this champion mindset, other people suddenly realize it's accessible for them. Because at some point they were told they couldn't, wouldn't, should it, or they tried it and failed and they gave up. The muscle in the head, right? The ability to activate certain things in your mindset, affirmations and otherwise, but then not allow negated language, not allow that monkey mind, that little whisper, that insidious thing that tells you you can't, if you don't let that in, right? Or if you just allow it to pass through you, because it's going to show up, it shows up for all of us, then suddenly you become bulletproof. And your why will always override the how you will find a way to get it done straight up. So you know, it, it is it's, it's a psychologist approach through the gym that elicits this opportunity for their paradigm to shift. And it doesn't it doesn't always happen at the same time for people, it could happen week two, that could happen week 10, when we're on the mountain. It, but at some point, it does happen for every athlete that goes through. What has this done for you? Woo, man, you want to know what's done for me? Yeah, so I'll, I'll try to do this without too much emotion. It has given me permission to go into and, and, and to be willing to grow and learn from the little me that was 10, year old, 10 years old and sexually abused. And in that, these athletes, again, I think I started this because I recognized the need and it felt good because I, I was excited and my passion was, was meaningful to serve these people in this population. But I also did, I think as a distraction, so I didn't have to deal with some of my own stuff. And it took me a couple of years and some serious burnout to realize, whoa, the things I'm preaching to them, I need to do for myself. So the athletes of the Adaptive Training Foundation have given me permission to really wade into the water in my own stuff and to heal and work through it, which has made me more powerful and even more impactful for the mission itself. And the other thing that's been really impactful is my kids don't see disability. You know, we had a double baloney amputee come over to the house uh, when he first got to town and have dinner. And it was, he'd been here like 30 minutes and he, he, the girls went in the other room. I have an eight and six year old little girl. And, and he said, dude, I'm freaking out because your kids, they're not even looking at my legs. Right. Or like, they're not even staring at me because that's so abnormal for the rest of the world. So, yeah. you know, ATF has given me permission and has made my life uh, much more rich and more meaningful. And then it has also, uh, you know, endowed my, my family with a perspective that if I leave the earth tomorrow, I'm incredibly proud of. Well, certainly a sense of purpose, right? In terms of what you're doing, how you do it. And you mentioned, you know, what has really given you gigantic leaps in your life and the whole, you know, phrase around being, vulnerable, right? Which it didn't take me till 50 
to figure that that word out, right? And mm -hmm. it's really when all these gifts really started to flow in. And everything that I've done has cost me money. These gifts I'm talking about, there's no financial reward. Everything I do costs money. And, um, but it's the people, it's the relationships of, that, you know, even, even this experience I had with you and your team and why you picked me to be with that on that particular boat with that particular person, um, who I held on to, you know, all the way down the river, you know, I don't know, but it was, there was another guy named Q, he was in the boat. And, um, so, you know, it was just a really cool, really, really cool experience. Tell me, Tell me, give me an example of, I mean, I gave an example from based on my one and only really interaction with somebody that brought me to tears, but give me something that has been maybe the, like when you start talking about that person's arc and the arc yeah. coming in, they were completely a hundred percent damaged. And by the time they went through this program and the, the, you know, you saw this flower just really blossom. I'm sure there's, there's lots of stories like this, yeah. but is there one that sticks out, you know, yeah. one more than the other? Yeah. Over 250 of these stories are just oh, jaw dropping. Wow. Impacts. One that comes to mind, a woman who was in a motorcycle accident with her husband, her husband passed. She ended up losing her leg above the knee. She remembered like nothing from the occurrence aside from news clippings and, you know, police reports and so on. And, you know, like a lot of these athletes, they come in at orientation, their posture, their, you know, body position sucks and they're very somber. And they say things like, I just, I just want to feel normal again. I just want to get back to who I was before this. And it's funny because I, I, I early in on say, Hey, how about if I walked up to you and I tried to compliment you and say, Hey Mark, you're really normal, bud. Like who wants to be called normal? The truth is, yeah. is, Let's replace that with uncommon, right? Uh -huh. That's a really uncommon person, right? I want to get to know that person's story. Like what is, because wisdom is healed pain. And when I'm around a lot of people that have been, you know, uh, affected by traumas or been dealt scars, there's a wisdom in them. And, I, and I'm eager and curious to listen to the way that they position what has happened to them as if it's for or against them. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, being able to talk to this woman early on in the program was just this very timid thing. And then you could see her, right? Like a plane taking off, just slowly getting more altitude and a little bit more swagger, a little bit more attitude, a little bit more energy and emotion. Well, we do this thing called somatic emotional release. It's basically using breath work to, to dance a tightrope between your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, which is fight or flight, rest and digest, right? Those are the two. And um, to be able to create governance over those, we see certain things in the body being stored and being stuck and other things moving. And there's, there's asymmetry usually. So we'll put her on this yoga mat. We do six to eight rounds of intense breath work. And then we ask her to visualize and go back to the night of, and this takes her trusting us like bulletproof trust because we're taking her to the, to the most vulnerable state, right? Into the, her, her biggest level of trauma. So Finally, after about six rounds, she sat up and tears streaming down her face. She said, I remember the last thing he said to me. I remember leaving the restaurant. I remember holding him as, and, and I mean, I do, I got goosebumps right now. And she's just now to a lot of people, most people would probably go, I don't even want to know. I don't even want to go there. But for her, she needed that. She wanted some closure and she wanted to see what could come up so that she couldn't, so that she wouldn't suppress or repress it any longer, knowing that this path that we were guiding her through was that, you know, the emotions stored in the body create disharmony and dis-ease over time. And so that suddenly, boom, for her, it was like, you know, just, just the NOS button. And she took off and at graduation, she stood up and she, you know, earned her patch. And she's like, I'm going to bubba da bubba da bubba. I'm going to do this. I'm going to climb this. I'm going to work here. I'm going to, and it was like, watch out world. Right. So those are those things that if we can earn their trust, there's plenty of, again, doing a week of adaptive skiing. That's a cool thing. Giving a veteran a job or a house or something. That's great stuff. But if we're not right between the ears, it's not going to stick. It's not going to be sustainable, right? So we, we built a not-for-profit that is going to wade into the water, do life for nine weeks with the hopes that when the wheels start to shake, they can recall the tools they've been equipped with, but also be able to call us and say, hey, am I crazy? Everybody says I'm crazy. Like, hey, you're not crazy. You're just uncommon. So let's take mm -hmm. an uncommon approach to problem solve our way through this. It's awesome. Love that. Love that. So uh, shifting just a hair, I want to know about your Ellen experience. Yeah. Yo, Ellen, um, I'll be honest. I, I, I think that the, the rumors, well, they're not even rumors now. They're, they've come out. I, I don't think 
Ellen has a great track record, you know, for her people and her staff. And if I'm honest, bro, I, I, Ellen was, it wasn't a letdown. It was a cool experience, but it was, it was dog and pony, man. And it was how many times do we have to go through the questions that she's going to bring up? It was like, they scripted basically, you know, uh, like it's not scripted, but it is scripted. And like, mm-hmm. you know, I don't, I'm not here to bash Ellen. It was a great yeah. exposure and a great platform, but it just felt like it was, yeah, just an industrial line. And it just didn't feel authentic. I think about the things in the last eight years and a lot of people will never see them because they weren't built for external facing, you know, projects, but it's like when you show up and you don't care who's watching or who sees it and everybody shows up that way, then if it is projected out into the world, the frequency or the energy around it, the reception of that is so much more altruistic and authentic. I mean, I'm not saying you can't plan, but you know, I mean like even your film crew on Everest, right. And everything that led up to it, that was a level of commitment where they too are going to have to be vulnerable, are going to have to put themselves in harm's way to get this thing done. And it's a different mindset that approaches it than like an Ellen experience or something like that. Well, the whole thing, like to your, to your point on the film, it, it's just when we started the, when we started the project up until the last day it came out the mountain, there was no plan. There was no storyline. It was just like the storyline was like, here's Mark. He's a former NFL player. His daughter has epilepsy and he's going to Mount Everest. Like what's going to happen now. Right. And yeah. so it's all the film and then all the drama went down and just, you know, I, I, anytime somebody, anytime somebody uh, reaches out to me and they want me to, to be on their podcast and they, 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 they've sent me, this doesn't happen very often, but they've sent me like a 10 point questionnaire. <laughs> just don't do it. Right. Because again, you just don't know where these conversations will go and you do want them to be authentic because that is what makes things really rich and really digging in. And I think the whole key, like in, in anything that you do, it's the more you listen, the more you can dig and really uncover what's really going on, you know? So for, in terms of uh, ATF, where do you see that going from here? Because you guys have tremendous amount of momentum and, you know, I just, I can't imagine the amount of lives you said 200 and something people have, have, have gone through your program. And, yeah. and, and so, you know, to elevate that to a different level, I didn't even know what that level would be. Yeah. So I think the root is what we've touched on today, which is storytelling, right? People find themselves in other people's stories. So we are in really exciting. I can't say much because of NDA and shopping agreements, but in 2022, there will be a docu-series. So imagine this, right? The character development is badass. So you have 10 adaptive athletes, some veterans, some civilian from all different walks, diversity, diversity of life. And they're going to go through this nine week course, right? And, and yes, there's this episodic kind of hero's arc as you follow them through this journey. Uh, but then you watch this cohort eventually go on their redeployment trip and they're bombing it down the mountain or whatever. Then they come back to train the new class. Mm-hmm. So you're going to be able to see the person that was in this pit have this crescendo. And then where are they now? Well, now they're back to pay it forward. Now, the storytelling side of that is going to put a huge spotlight on a large platform. Then there's going to be tens of thousands because there's 40 million Americans that have been labeled and filed with a physical disability in just the United States, 40 million, okay? Now, let's say 10 or 20,000 of those apply to come to my program, right? That, that is, that's not good math, right? Yeah. And again, we're, the, the laboratory that is my program is the gym. We're looking for a specific type of person. Mm-hmm. I need to build something for the masses that's scalable. And it's not in brick and mortar, especially not in a po- post-COVID landscape. So what it is, is this adaptive class. We're building a hybrid digital infrastructure. People are familiar with masterclass, similar Mm -hmm. concept. But the idea would be a a nine-week protocol that follows what we do in the gym, but done in a self-directed weekly way with a -a once-a-week live interface with one of our alumni coaches who have graduated. Mm -hmm. It helps the, 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 the adaptive athlete that's graduated. They get paid, right, to do a once a week live with other people with similar impairments. So if I'm an above knee amputee, I have 30 above knee amputees in my class uh, on the hybrid digital. And we're going to do a once a week live interface where I'm going to take them through a workout. They're doing the same breath and meditation stuff, being able to talk about just life as an above knee amputee. So the future of ATF is a model that is scalable in a digital infrastructure and a docu-series that is going to be able to tell stories for maximizing support awareness and just the opportunity for, you know, again, having, you know, getting blown up, right. Going on a first deployment, being 19 years old, coming back a triple amputee. Mm -hmm. One of the guys in our gym is this exact guy. The what next question isn't just it. It's like, where can I even 
provision for myself. Cause if I earn more than X, right. I lose my social security and disability. So there's this trap, mm. right. And with it, it's like, yo, Hey, take victim on a silver platter, go take your prescription, your meds and go sit on the couch. And what we're saying is like, no, man, the thing, the, the thing that has, has caused you this trauma is actually a qualifying factor for where you can be of great contribution to society and others. So we're just shifting that narrative in a bottom-up approach saying the people closest to these quote problems are the best to solve them, right? If they can solve them and earn while doing it, dude, you've got to actually, you've got a pretty entrepreneurial social interface. And that's, that's really where we're going with ATF. I love this. I love this. Where can people find you? Cause, cause people need yep. to hear more about this, this stuff. Yeah. Thanks, man. I mean, certainly social media, right. seems like that's a go-to for everyone, whether that's myself, David Vibora or adaptive training foundation on those social channels, or you can go to team ATF, team ATF.org. The website has sponsorship opportunities, donation opportunities. Here's where I tell people that are listening. Some people have the capacity to donate. That's awesome. You can buy a t-shirt right? There's, there's swag that's on the site that all those proceeds go to athlete sponsorships and you can wear it when somebody asks, you can talk about it. But the last thing I'll say that is certainly free is if you see a video and it, and it, it resonates with you, it captivates you, it motivates you, share it, share it, tag us, tag me, because you never know who in your sphere of influence is going to see that post or share and be touched, right? Like I'm just a believer that you look somebody in their eyes, you treat them like a whole person and that person shows up. And sometimes just sharing that video is that connect that, you know, in the disconnected world, we realize that that can be that little dose of hope, right? And that can be all the difference. Well, I can say this with absolute certainty. Uh, you are not Mr. Irrelevant. You are very <laughs> relevant. You're doing amazing things with ATF and just the positivity that you glow when you're around others like myself when I had a uh, really – Amazing opportunity to be a part of your of your organization for one day in association with Higher Ground, who I'm connected with, and uh, really hope that in the future that either I'm in Dallas or uh, you're back here in, in some valley and I can come out and visit your your facility or you know we're floating down another river you know somewhere out here in the valley. So for that, thank you very much for coming on. Thank you for doing what you do. And uh, best of luck in the future. And if there's anything I can do to, you know, further your cause, you let me know. Thanks, brother. Thank you. I'd say this. The only personal ask is when you do answer the what's next question for you, you got to let me know because I uh, got a sneaky suspicion I'm going to be, I want to be a part of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's coming. It's it's some clarity is coming around really quick. So, all right, folks, there he is, the one, the only David Borboro. There we go. (laughs) Take care. Hey, and thank you so much for listening to the Find Your Summit podcast. We are so glad to have you along for this journey. And if you enjoy the show, please tell a friend, share it on iTunes, spread it to the planet. We're looking to broadcast this to every person that is out there because, as you know, everybody has their own summit that they're going after. Okay, if you're looking to follow my journey, you can find that through my social links on markpattisonnfl.com. That's Mark, M-A-R-K, Pattison, P-A-T-T-I-S-O-N, NFL.com. So until the next podcast, just remember, clear eyes, full hearts, and remember, it takes a little more to make a champion, so make it happen. Thank you. Bye. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.